afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, and a very warm welcome to this session one of the conference. It is so wonderful to see so many old friends and make new ones, but to see them in person rather than on a Zoom screen. And uh, I hope that we never go back to that, even if Zoom has its plus points. Um, as Sue said, my name is Amitabh Banerjee. Uh, I, in, I started life as an Indian diplomat and ended up spending 25 years at the Commonwealth Secretariat. Uh, I now work for an NGO called the Global Leadership Foundation, which is a bunch of 44 retired leaders from around the world who are quietly available to give advice on request to any of today's leaders. Um, the title of this session is Multilateralism and Soft Power in an Age of Nationalism, Conflict and Division. Uh, we have 90 minutes. Uh, our aim would be to roughly take half of that for our speakers to make presentations and then leave enough time for you, the audience, to ask questions and to make comments. Uh, you already know who the panelists are, but I will briefly introduce them before giving each the floor. Uh, my own task is very easy. I, I am the moderator. Uh, but permit me to exercise privilege and make a few opening remarks. Um, all the terms in the latter part of the title of this session, nationalism, conflict, division, uh, are defining features of our time. And the purpose <coughs> of this session is to examine whether and how multilateral approaches can still work in the face of these serious challenges. We are here talking about multilateralism in the larger global sense, not just the Commonwealth. Uh, multilateralism, I think, took a huge knock about 11 months ago when a veto-wielding permanent five-member state committed aggression against a sovereign neighboring state, leading to the first major conflict in Europe since World War II. Multilateral approaches have not helped to end conflicts and divisions in, in the South Caucasus, in the Western Balkans, uh, in Myanmar, in the Horn of Africa, the Great Lakes region, etc. And even in the Commonwealth, there are deep-seated divisions and tensions in a number of countries, exacerbated by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, by climate change, and by the economic impact of the war in Ukraine. Commonwealth political values have also suffered as a result with authoritarianism making a comeback. The multilateral system has also recently struggled in the face of strident nationalism. It is noteworthy that Joe Biden announced to the world the, the transition from his predecessor, Mr. Trump, with the slogan, America is back. Across the world, there are increasing instances of nations that are more insular than ever before. On the other hand, multilateralism was celebrated when COP27 produced an important consensus on loss and damage at Sharm el Sheikh. The Black Sea Grain Agreement brokered by the UN is another positive story to tell. Uh, the IAEA's intervention on the Zaporizhia nuclear plant has so far averted a catastrophe, fingers crossed. The truth is there is no escape from multilateralism if one is to seriously address the key challenges of our time, such as climate change, pandemic preparedness, poverty alleviation, or transnational, transnational crime, <coughs> just to mention a few. And what of the Commonwealth in an age of nationalism, conflict, and division? Has this unique organization played to its full potential? Is it firing on all cylinders? Is it being instrumental in building consensus on critical issues? And how can it do better? So with those opening remarks, I will first pass the floor to David Wardrop, uh, who has been chair of the Westminster branch of the United Nations Association since 2001. He has been active in the UN Association in many capacities since 1974, steering the campaign to return the UK to membership of UNESCO, coordinating international support for the UN's reopened inquiry into the death of Secretary General Doug Hammarskjöld, and the successful effort to name United Nations Green close to Parliament outside Westminster Central Hall, which of course has a central place in UN history. 
that, that was on the occasion of the UN 75th anniversary. He has also coordinated international support for the new Alexandria Library, and his professional career was in engineering and in the motor industry. David, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's so unfortunate that this august meeting starts with a party pooper. I hope to live up to that reputation <laughs> and um, to question a lot of the assumptions that we're likely to make. But I am, as introduced, uh, originally an engineer. Um, my job was designing and manufacturing equipment and selling it to overseas customers, to working in the motor industry. And you see patterns when you move from one field to another um, all too easily reproduced. And uh, it's from perhaps from that angle that I'm coming here. Um, as a scientist, I'm not a scientist, but I admired the scientist Luc Montagnier, the French chemist who identified the HIV impact on AIDS. He got his Nobel Prize in 2008, a long time after his work. Pretty um, difficult time for him. But he likened the sort of challenge we're facing today to a centrifuge, that the natural force is thrusting us apart. And it needs institutions, multilateralism, whatever it might like to call itself in so many ways, to actually hold us all back together again. Let's face it, the natural straight is with humanity, is to do our own thing. We are selfish beasts. And we have to create these institutions which persuade us that, to coin a phrase, together we do better. And we've got to accept that like the search for peace, there's no steady state at all. But it's seen as a good thing, nevertheless. The actual definitive features of multilateralism, we know I'm not going to repeat them here. But the trouble is that those nation states you want to embark on naturalism, multilateralism for their benefit, they don't necessarily see that they should stick with them. Let's take Afri an African state, an African state. It can identify with the G77, identify with the Africa Union, Afri uh, with the Commonwealth, with the Africa Group at the United Nations. All of these organizations give it a different cloak that might suit it at the time. Short-termism is with us, and we have to recognize that. And this is something I've found in my own field, in the field of engineering, that engineers and designers always want to do their own thing. But there came a time when I was a young engineer that there was a move to try and bring things back together, to have some logic in the way we, we designed and built items. So instead of giving random part numbers to every item there was, we gave a part number which related to its size, its shape, the material it was made of. So this made sure we didn't duplicate something that had already been made. It accelerated the production of, of, um, of uh, creative work in the engineering field in the 60s and 70s. But then the centrifuge took over and people said, our creativity is being damaged. We want to break out again. And the engineering field was left with a dilemma which was overcome by the introduction of computers which could spend their time finding things which were the same shape, the same size, the same material. And that particular let out for the engineers and the designers was there. I remember in the late 90s, Unilever, the great conglomerate, was looking at its work in Africa, trying to have a multilateral approach in all its sales operations in different countries to see that there was some coordination for the actual benefit, financial and other, otherwise, of, of Unilever. At the same time, the United Nations was trying to coordinate once again its 30 different agencies in Africa to bring together some sort of, some sort of um, coordinated message in each of its, in the member states in Africa. This, this special initiative for Africa introduced by Kofi Annan. Its really residual benefit was that the UNDP resident coordinator was at last recognized as the leading person in any particular country. 
But during that exercise by the UN in the 90s, they had to agree on disputes, disputes procedure um, and all sorts of mechanisms which we associate with multilateralism properly. So with Unilever and with the UN Special Initiative for Africa, we, both, we saw examples of efforts towards it, but always fighting against what I call the, the, the steady state, that is the flinging apart. The UN's work with its silos is always a problem. In 2017, Kevin Rudd, who I'm sure many of you know, headed the Independent Commission on Multilateralism for the UN. And it came out with answers or proposals which no one anticipated. They all related really to peace, fundraising for prevention of, of, of conflict, continuing the peace ref op operations reform, centralizing leadership and counterterrorism, improving gender balance, and so on. The UN scratched its head and said, well, that's not exactly what we're looking for. But in the UN 75, here was a, the time when everything was reversed. The original program to mark the 75th anniversary of the UN was attacked by civil society like ourselves, who said, this is so old fashioned, this is so bureaucratic, there's no way that the international community are going to, should, should have to wear this after 75 years. And it was at that particular time, it was the UN itself which broke out, which became the force, the centrifugal force breaking out and said, we're not going to stick with the straitjacket which member states have insisted upon us. So all of us in the Together First program, a global network of individuals and organizations campaigning to improve global governance took off. So there you see a complete reversal. And the UN has been in that state of flux ever since. The Secretary General's document, Our Common Agenda, set out to ask for a more networked and inclusive quote, multilateral system. But what exactly was he looking for? It had to be inclusive of all voices, civil society, private sector, and international organizations like the Commonwealth too. I'll come to that point. Um, so how is that process going now? So a high level advisory board, joint chaired by Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and Stephen Lovan, the ex prime minister of Sweden, are at this moment trawling the world for ideas question mark. I don't know the answer to this question. Who in the Commonwealth are they talking to? These current hearings worldwide will complete in time for a presentation of papers at the UN this September. And the following September, the summit of the future will take place, which will look at the global public goods. What actually should be bringing us all together in a multilateral format? Sustainable, sustainable development before, beyond 2030, financial architecture, peace, outer space, and so on. As I said, who are, whose voices are there? In a little pre-Zoom meeting we had, we were discussing who were the voices at COP27. And some friends here were at COP27, and they will be able to answer better than I. But it's, we made some claim that one of the most important leaders, Sherry Raymond from Pakistan, a member of the Commonwealth, was actually speaking for the G77. Hers was the most important voice there, I guess. But as of two days ago, the leader of G77 is Cuba. So the Commonwealth doesn't have all those links. Back to the, 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 the um, presence of the Commonwealth of the United Nations, the community of Portuguese-speaking countries is on the list of regional organizations which the UN is dealing with. So is Francophonie. There's a lot of fluidity in Francophonie. Um, dare I ask somebody to put their hand up if you really know who is the Secretary General or the nationality of the Secretary General of Francophonie? Sue. Isn't that wonderful? That fluidity is, is, is the, the short termism I'm speaking about. Why should not people not adopt a different cloak if it suits them? But this is something I think we have to accept. I'm impressed by so many people have their hand up. <laughs> So um, the, the role for the, the, the Commonwealth, I know that in December 19, there was a memorandum of understanding between the UN and the Commonwealth and its, its working governance and peace, sustainable development and all the normal things you'd expect these two organizations to deal with. Well, after three years, where do we see the result of that work? I look forward to learning about that. 
But this leads me on to the principle of soft power. And with a new head of the Commonwealth, the king, I think it's a good, it's a good time to review exactly how, we're, how it, the Commonwealth is perceived. Because the reverse of the coin of soft power is risk, risk of, of, of image. And I think with the new head of the Commonwealth, a lot of people worldwide have their own views, which might, might impact upon the Commonwealth's identity too. Um, I can talk about Harry's book, how that is taken in Canada or Australia or things like that. These are things which now the Commonwealth has to face up to, I believe. Look at the work of the Commonwealth right from 1945 when its members came together just before the San Francisco Conference and gave that wonderful gift to the United Nations, the, the draft of the preamble to the Charter. Moving through the years, what was the Commonwealth's role when Malaya was in, uh, facing off with Indonesia? And when Uganda and Tanzania, two Commonwealth members, I can see what the OAU did, but I cannot see what the Commonwealth did. In the 2022 communique, which came out this year from Kigali, there's a paragraph on Guyana and Venezuela, one on Belize and Guatemala. I see that there's a couple of days ago, the UK is now chairman of the G13, those countries helping Guatemala. But what about Mauritius and the United Kingdom? Where is that? When you think that with the 2019 ICJ decision in Mauritius, I was in New York by chance at the time when, when the, when the um, General Assembly was discussing that point. And all of us have seen the opinion, the legal opinions of Commonwealth states on that. Why no paragraph in the communique on that subject? There is a global soft power index which looks at the way in which all countries are judged by ordinary people. And I won't go into it at this point, which are the ones up and they go up and down and up and down. It, the UK has seen an improvement in the governance pillar from ninth to fourth in 2022, but that was before three prime ministers. I wonder what it's going to be like in April this year. But then let's superimpose for a moment the Commonwealth on that soft power index. Where would it be? How would it be, would it be perceived by these same people around the world who are judging 135 countries? I'm looking at it now, finally, from its position in the United Nations. I'm fed up with listening to soft talk about we are not a regional power. The, United, the Commonwealth was on that UN list of organizations with which the, it dealt. But as Amitav and I have checked, it's fallen off. That should not have happened. Mm -hmm. Some of you, all of you I'm sure, have been into the lobby of the, of the UN. And in that great area which is used by UN agencies to display their work. I've checked the criteria of those organizations which can use this space. The Commonwealth fits perfectly, fits perfectly. What about the Commonwealth returning in parentheses, underlined exclamation in color to the United Nations, taking over that space and showing, should we say women in the Commonwealth, what they have contributed to the globe. And this would be the opportunity for the new head of the Commonwealth to follow in his mother's footsteps. She spoke twice to the General Assembly to say the Commonwealth is here and we're here to stay. Thank you. We will move along. I will now give the floor to Dr. Paul Flather, uh, who began his career as a journalist working for the BBC, the New Statesman and the Times Higher Education Supplement, among others. He moved into academia and politics, uh, was elected chair of the London Post Schools Education Committee, founding CEO then of the Central European University in Prague, Warsaw and Budapest. He was then director of international affairs for Oxford University and founding secretary general of the Europeum, also serving as a fellow of Mansfield and Corpus Christi colleges in Oxford. Paul, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Amitabh. Thank you, David. Well, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, it's glorious um, to be back in, uh, in Cumberland Lodge. I think we had a, an event here 10 or 12 years ago, which was incredibly 
successful and enjoyable. And of course, it is, in theory at least, a seat of soft power uh, where we are. But I'll come back to that, and David has raised that issue. Look, the situation is, is very, very serious. The, our world is in flux. Some people say we're in permanent crisis. Others simply say that all the rules and norms that we set up in the post-Second World War settlement are um, being cast asunder, falling apart. Globalization itself is in reverse. That's what The Economist leads on this week. And we've had a number of very profound shocks, haven't we? Go back to 2008-9, we had the global recession, which brought austerity all around the world. Then we had the COVID, and that also brought recession. And we've had this barbaric invasion of Ukraine, which has ended any idea of the Cold War dividend that we had counted on and how. Uh, we've now got an energy crisis out of that, and we've got global inflation. So these are profound shocks which affect the Commonwealth as much as they affect any other nation. Tectonic plates are shifting. And where is the Commonwealth? Maybe we don't know enough publicly about all its activities behind the scenes. But my argument is that we're conspicuous by our absence. Last week, did you know that India hosted 120 countries in a Global South conference in Delhi? India happens to be the chairman of the G20. Last November, President Biden hosted 100 countries at a democracy summit in New York. Uh, currently, China is uh, promoting its Belt and Road Initiative and has working with more than 50 countries, 60 countries, including many from the Commonwealth around the world. Uh, picking off vulnerable states, in fact. Where is the Commonwealth? What I want to do is to pick three themes, which I want to explore in a little detail, and then I want to see what our assets are and see what we could be doing. And I speak as an, an outsider, and I, so I have to express some humility if I've um, uh, misgaged certain things. So the first uh, theme I want to look at is democratic backsliding. Okay, if you look at any index, and Freedom House is probably one of the more popular ones, we've had 16 years of democratic recession. Only 20% of the world lives in truly democratic or free countries. 38% live under authoritarian rule. So twice as much uh, of the global planet is under authoritarianism. And the rest live in, in, in various degrees of, of, uh, of freedom. And in fact, uh, 2021 saw more coups in a year than at any time in the previous uh, decade. Um, and of course, the story inside the Commonwealth is not at all rosy. In fact, I did some digging for this talk. I tried to do some research. I looked at various sites. I looked on various uh, places. And if you, um, uh, and I tried to construct a table. I have to construct this table um, from other sources. And this is a table which shows the democratic recession within the Commonwealth. Um, you're, you, this won't be any surprise to you, but just to be clear, uh, in this 10-year in this period, and this is the, uh, the uh, German sources, uh, Bangladesh, Mozambique, Uganda, Pakistan, Malta, India, Zambia, South Africa, and Namibia have gone backwards in democracy. Fiji and Madagascar remain hard authoritarian, hard authoritarian, yet they remain inside the Commonwealth without any threat of suspension. And Gambia, Malaysia, um, uh, Maldives, Sri Lanka, Seychelles, one or two other countries have improved, but not, not necessarily sufficiently to move up a category. So, okay, we've got our charter, which promotes democratic processes with reference to the Commonwealth. Um, but what we don't do, or what we don't seem to do, and here I'm, I'm ready to be corrected, we don't collect much proper data on ourselves. Now, we know why that is, because if we collected the data, we'll expose some of this kind of information more dramatically, and it's not necessarily pleasant. We're very good at observing elections, and our chair is, is um, uh, very involved in that work. But then, you know, when, the, when we observed that the Nigerian election, I forget which one, was completely corrupt, nothing actually changed. 
Again, you can correct me on that. The Commonwealth Parliamentary Association is busy promoting knowledge about democracy, but if you go to their website, there's not much you can learn about that they've actually done, apart from the very important area of gender equality. Human rights, um, well, we all share a general frustration on that, and of course we're very disappointed that there wasn't a High Commissioner for Human Rights appointed. Now we've taken in two new members with hugely suspect regimes. So there's a lot of backsliding to deal with. Second theme, rise of nationalism, populism, and what it's producing is a retreat from globalization. We thought the globalized world would bring us all together. Uh, David has talked about the uh, processes of, of centrifugal and multilateral uh, um, forces. Um, but now we actually live in a world of real politic. This is picking up your point, where rules are disregarded and people act in their self-interest. And of course, we discovered this on the Ukraine vote where nine Commonwealth members did not join the general condemnation of, I mean, can there be a more blunt occasion when you have to be critical? Now I know, and I wrote a piece about this uh, uh, for our uh, website or our journal, I can't remember. And, and there are good reasons, good reasons why countries like South Africa and India could not come aboard. But, you know, you, you have to, uh, at some point, take a stance. You have to, at some point, uh, see how uh, it affects your, your values. Of course, Trump was a, a very embarrassing example of the rise of strongman politics. And I did, I have spared you the slides, but I do have pictures of all the strongman and all these sort of things, but I thought that, that it wouldn't actually fit in. Um, but I did want to show you this one, one slide. Now, the European Union is, is a fantastic new experiment in global politics. Multilateral, um, uh, sharing, pooling sovereignty, and actually working. And uh, perhaps, uh, ironically, working better without Britain. But uh, what, was our, what was our decision? Leading, leading force in the Commonwealth. Unfortunately, we decided, you know, we don't want to go there, but we decided to leave. And that, we know, was quite unpopular with many Commonwealth countries, but they didn't say it loud enough, I thought. So the, so the actual narrative was, let Britain leave, let it become a global power, and let it turn to the Commonwealth more. Of course, that hasn't uh, ever emerged, and we didn't think it would. So um, the situation is more nationalism, more self-interest, and when you factor in COVID, and when you factor in the Ukraine war, we are now in a position, and The Economist that I mentioned has a large article on this, but people have been picking on, on this trend for quite a while. People are turning to self-sufficiency. So Biden has just passed a bill, he's just put a bill through Congress to give $53 billion uh, worth of subsidies to set up chip factories in uh, America because they can't rely, given these global shocks, they can't rely on what is a vital uh, element. And tw uh, 28 billion uh, factories, uh, factories are now opening in, in Arizona. So what's happening is that the, the old idea, the Adam Smith idea of trade being done where it has the greatest comparative advantage is being reversed quite significantly. Um, and uh, obviously it, it goes with my third point, which I'm going to discuss, the, the, the rise of China. Um, and, and what the economist is talking about is we're now in a zero-sum game. Again, where is the Commonwealth? I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So my third trend is, is the rise of China. I am extremely concerned about its growing influence in the world. I know that's not fashionable, but it's a reality and we have to kind of face it. And it's affecting many Commonwealth countries very, very seriously. Uh, China emerged when the WTO allowed it to become a member. Note to editor, the WTO is now a broken, busted flush. None of its rule enforcing uh, uh, activities uh, can be trusted. But what we do know is that uh, obviously short of investment, looking for uh, advancement, uh, many countries are now turning to China, which is offering investment, and doing it on quite complicated and sometimes unfavorable terms. And you get in a situation like Sri Lanka has faced, where you have a sovereign 
debt crisis. Zambia has a sovereign debt crisis. Pakistan de facto has a sovereign debt crisis. That means they're in hock and they owe most of, the, most of their debt is owed to China, which has no obligation to waive it. It may, it may not. It may do so by extracting further controls over certain key ports and certain strategic minerals. Um, and so we have, to, we have to think about this as a Commonwealth because I feel that we ought to have a unit at least to give guidance and advice to countries that are being picked off. And this is happening more and more in the Caribbean. Look, did you know, I just did a little bit of research, China has invested 254 billion in Africa. America has invented, invested 44 billion. It's phenomenal in terms of its influence. Now, Biden has actually invited the African Union to join the G20 because he's behind the curve and he's trying to compete with China. By the way, why, you know, not the Commonwealth, but the African Union, and has promised to invest 55 billion in uh, Africa in the future. But the Chinese have been meeting African leaders regularly since 2000 at a very high level, conferences either in Africa or in Beijing. They're way ahead of us uh, in terms of this game. And of course, India and the UK, the two countries which probably also have uh, reasonably strong African links, are nowhere on this table. So we have to, we have to take a stance. We have to do what is possible um, and at least warn people about the dangers of this, uh, what might seem pleasant diplomacy and, 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 and positive investment, uh, but actually comes with a lot of strings. I mean, I can go on with that. There are many other issues to talk about. I haven't got time to talk about corruption. Uh, uh, you mentioned that, um, Amitabh. I haven't got to talk about the uh, problems with the media, freedom of expression, and fake news. The CJA is doing great work on that, highlighting it and generally security issues. But what I want to finish, if I've got a few more minutes, is to look at some of the positive things that, uh, that we have. What are our assets? What are our aims? And, and if we are doing some of these things, then it's obviously too quiet. It's below the parapet. Um, we don't have hard power. Uh, we have very limited soft power. UK is number two, actually, on the soft power list. I was surprised that we were still so high um, and of course, but all our assets, when I look at them individually, are in decline. The BBC, World Service, our diplomacy, our parliament, point was just made, um, our sport, not bad, football, but monarchy, no comment needed, even language, no longer such an advantage, and I find that people abroad speak English a lot better than so many people in this country, imperial legacy, huge label that's getting larger and larger. Uh, so, you know, arts, excellent, law, very good, but, you know, it's gone down. India, the other country that has clear soft power, yoga, uh, Bollywood, peacemaking, inclusiveness, all going down. And by the way, neither of India nor Britain particularly focuses soft power on the Commonwealth. So what is the point there? Other countries that might have soft power, Canada, strong, strong uh, reputation in, in, in human rights and so on, and Australia, Australia uh, um, but you know, they're not powerful. So we might have to not use soft power, not use hard power, of course. Maybe we have to use smart power. This is a concept that was invented at NATO, and that is to target what we have as cleverly as we can. Now, I realize, and I'm an outsider, that as an intergovernmental voluntary association, there's not a lot that we can do, and we don't actually capture headlines uh, very much. But we did very well in fighting apartheid, and we did very well at the Port-au-Prince Chogum when Sarkozy and Brown and others came, and that was crucial in the build-up to COP in Paris. So we can do things if we make the best use of our assets and we really focus in the best ways that we can. And we can produce reports, we can do better fact-finding, we could make uh, targeted interventions, uh, we have a lot of expertise, um, and we have to, in a sense, try and fight for more presence rather than absence. What we, could we do in terms of democracy to prevent backsliding? I think we have to recognize 
this as an issue. Be more open about it. Accept kind of criticisms. But what we could do if we do have uh, uh, opposition, well, why can't we have conferences on good governance and democracy promotion? Why can't we, um, and by the way, I, I was involved in a lot of anti-corruption conferences with the British Council, which involved lots of uh, uh, Commonwealth people, so I think this is, in, this is possible. Why can't we collect more data and work more closely with you know, the Westminster Foundation or VDEM or IFIS or the Electoral Integrity Project? But above all, why can't we give scholarships to change makers, young, young democracy activists, and promote them and uh, uh, promote courses in universities on democracy? We can do this sort of soft stuff which could help in preventing backsliding. Leadership is a big problem, of course, and I can't, you know, we all know the kind of issues, but when we do have strong leaders, you don't need to have powerful assets to achieve things. So, you know, Sonny Ramphal is, of course, uh, 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 the, the, the figure par excellence. But if you think of leaders like Pierre Trudeau, who established Canada's, Canada's wonderful human rights uh, and liberal traditions, if you think of Nehru um, in the build-up to the Commonwealth and his various peace initiatives, even if they were too idealistic, obviously you can think of Mandela, you can think of one or two uh, uh, PMs uh, from Australia and from, from Britain. Um, but we're conspicuous, aren't we, with, with, with CMAG not necessarily performing consistently, uh, the eminent persons group ignored, and a, a variability in terms of the leader of the Commonwealth Secretariat. Two more points before I stop. Um, one is vulnerable states. We could do much more on vulnerable states. We all recognize this. We all agree that we're the only voice that can represent those 35 small states. Is it 35 or 32? 32. 32. 32. We all talk about it, and they have their meetings, but couldn't we really raise the flag? Couldn't we really uh, champion uh, 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 them? Um, and, you know, I, I can remember um, talking to people from the Maldives and so on when they were really, uh, when the situation got really serious. And remember, the Maldives went into dictatorship and we, we didn't do that much to help them. Um, there are problems because some of these small states survive as tax havens. Some of them uh, survive with... Um, illicit trade, if, you, if I can use that word. But they are targets for China. And I just think that, you know, this idea we must put these, we must build a sort of Lilliputian powerhouse. We must turn these 35 states into a more powerful unit. Um, and we must shout and scream on their behalf. Now, my final point is about diversity and unity. One of our weaknesses is that we're too diverse. And yet I think that in this world, which other organization can unite north and south, west and east, white and black, uh, poor and rich? We could actually turn this into um, more of a power as a, a unique <coughs> selling point. Um, Paul Collier, who's an Oxford economist of, of great repute, has this idea of reciprocal obligation as, as, as the way to, to reform capitalism. And that is that uh, uh, by, we, we must take, but we must also give back. And that's what I feel might be a good, uh, a, a better kind of motto for the Commonwealth, that you know, the, the, the richer and the poorer should have a more um, obvious sense of reciprocal obligation. I noticed that there was a book in the, um, in the lobby about Cumberland Lodge. It said, Glorious Seclusion which is why I said it's glorious to be here. I don't want the Commonwealth to live in glorious seclusion. Let's be more present. Thank you. Arif Zaman is our final speaker on the panel, a senior lecturer at Bloomsbury Institute in London, director of the Commonwealth Business Women's Network. He was global market and industry analyst at British Airways, contributing to BA's business principles and sustainability policy, during which time he was seconded to Chatham House as an associate fellow and wrote a best-selling book on reputational risk. 
Uh, from 2005 to 2014, he was advisor, corporate governance, and South Asia to the Commonwealth Business Council. And his other incarnation is a, is a doctorate, a PhD student at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. Arif, you have the floor. Thank you. Well, I just want to uh, begin by saying how, what a pleasure it is to be back at Cumberland Lodge. Um, it might be freezing out there, but the sun is certainly on our side today. So great to be back here at Cumberland Lodge. Now, I'm, um, in fact, the most important thing I've got to do is bring my timer. Because <laughs> I know how stern Roundtable is on timing. So make sure that I'll, I'll be um, on time. Um, so some of you will remember Malia Lodi, who was uh, Pakistan's High Commissioner here for a number of years. In fact, I think she has, I say Namatav over lunch, I think she has a distinction by being the only High Commissioner probably who in a single term has um, been involved in negotiations to get her country readmitted or re-lift the suspension, not once but twice within that period. But I, I, when I um, mentioned to Malia, um, uh, that's probably her on the phone, but I mentioned to Malia that I, um, I was on this panel today, um, she um, made a, just a, one observation which I thought was interesting um, in so far as um, multilateralism. Um, she went from here, after she finished her time as High Commissioner here, the first woman in fact Pakistan had sent to the UK, she um, served a term at the UN as Pakistan's permanent representative, which um, finished, her term finished about just under three years ago. Um, and she was one of the people that was the signatories to the um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. On behalf of Pakistan, she put her name to that document. And an observation that she said, well, halfway through the, the target period that we've got to um, 2030, I don't think many of us, when we signed or put our country's name to that document, had any sense that multilateralism would be so fragile at this point on the journey. And I think that's, that may be an obvious point, but it's a, it's a useful one to keep in mind, that the expectations of multilateralism at that moment were very, very, very different to what they are today. So what I'm going to do is do three things in the time that I've got available to me. I'm going to say something about, so I think her point was about the mission, the machinery of multilateralism being a lot weaker now than, than it was then. I'm going to, three things I'm, I'm going to really say something about. One is I'm going to pick up on some recent developments. A range of recent reports have come out, usually this time of year, um, World Bank, World Economic Forum and others, and I'm going to draw upon that to kind of paint a a bit of a, um, a richer canvas, hopefully, on the context that we have in front of us, particularly with an emphasis on risk. Um, this will also reflect a roundtable meeting that um, took place at the uh, Commonwealth Secretariat. I can see somebody in the room who was there with me in that meeting, um, which brought together the World Bank economists and a number of Commonwealth Secretariat staff and others, um, some accredited organizations, to talk about what, that, um, what those messages were, and in particular around small states. So I'll say something about that. Um, the second thing that I will focus on is, so what does it mean for the Commonwealth, its implications for the Commonwealth, and then finally I'll touch on some of the entry points, if I can put it that way, for multilateralism, and yes, Sue, I will try and make the link to the PhD, and I'll get this fed into the PhD as well, which um, Philip's my supervisor for. Anyway, um, look, the global economy is on a razor's edge. Even a small shock can trigger an outright recession. That was one of the key messages from the World Bank at Marlborough House just last week. And this, this meeting right now, this panel in fact, is happening at a time when the 56 Commonwealth countries are actually meeting. Yes, this very second, right now, there is a, there is a senior officials meeting of trade officials, which itself is interesting given, as some of you will remember, they never used to meet, but now they've had two trade ministers meetings in the last five years, ahead of an expected trade ministerial later this year. So, we're, the World Bank is expecting a really weak global growth, um, around 1.7%, 2.7% um, in 2024. This is the lowest growth since the early 1990s. A key point here is it's the scope of the slowdown. By the end of 2024, GDP levels in emerging and, and developing economies will be roughly 6% below um, expected levels before the pandemic. And in fact, over the 2022 to 2024 period, gross investment in emerging market and developing economies is likely to grow at about 3.5% on average, less than half the rate that prevailed in the previous two decades. Now, the President of the World Bank himself said in the World Economic Prospects report that came out just, last, just earlier this month, 
And I quote, the crisis facing development is intensifying. So the question is whether there'll be a global recession. Um, some of you may be aware the World Economic Forum is meeting this week um, and uh, Global trade um, is clearly one of the things that people are looking at. I mentioned the senior officials meeting in process now. I gather it's a virtual meeting, as the Commonwealth is getting more used to that kind of process these days. Um, but global trade is set to reach a record level of around, um, I mean, the estimate for last year was $32 trillion. But global merchandise trade volumes um, grew by only 3.5% last year. But for this year, the World Trade Organization is forecasting a 1% increase, which is down sharply from the previous <coughs> estimate that they had just a few months ago, 3.4%. Now, as Dr. Ngozi, good friend of the Commonwealth, who I think will, I think she recalled one of the thing, best things that she said about the Chogger in Perth was meeting Julia Gillard, and they then brought out a great book on gender equality after that. But a comment that she made just 24 hours ago um, at Davos at the World Economic Forum was the issue, and I quote, the issue is not the absolute numbers but the uncertainty regarding estimates. And I think that is what you know, economists drive, drive, drive them crazy, you know, the uncertainty around these estimates. They're very hard. And this, to put a finger on this in terms of pinning it down, now that we know there are a number of negative factors in terms of trade, like lower economic growth, there are high prices of traded goods, concerns of debt sustainability, but there are some positive factors. We've seen improvements in the logistics of global trade. We've seen a number of trade agreements coming into fruition. Africa, of course, comes to mind. Um, and as Dr. Ngozi herself said again yesterday, she said the future of trade is green and it is inclusive. But there are really multiple downside risks. And um, you remember that conversation, that meeting in, in uh, Marlborough House just a few days ago. We, the World Bank was talking about persistent inflation, unanticipated un 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 monetary tightening, financial stress, social tensions, mm. geopolitical turmoil, energy and food security. The World Economic Forum has this, does this survey of economists and very striking, the, to, aunt, to the question that they ask is, which of the following best characterizes your, out, your outlook for the world over the short term, two years, and longer term, 10 years? 69% of economists um, say it'll, it'll be consistently volatile across economies and industries with multiple shocks accentuating divergent trajectory. 69% is an extraordinarily high figure. Now, policymakers clearly in that environment need to be proactive in an environment with multiple risks, but the, policy, the risk of policy mistakes is actually also higher. The reality is there's not much agreement about what the big policy priorities are, poverty reduction, income convergence, climate change. Having said that, the good news is that everyone agrees there's one solution. We need to have sustained strong investment growth if we're likely to make progress to deliver on the policy priorities. But we, all, we clearly also need to collaborate to address these global problems and strengthening resilience and inclusion, increasing female labor force participation and promoting financial inclusion are some of the things that sometimes get mentioned. Fitch, the, um, the Global Debt Ratings Agency, brought out its own report um, just a few days ago, and they talked about the fact we're moving from a period in which one or two major risks dominate, such as the pandemic or Russia's invasion of Ukraine, to a period in which there'll be a multiplicity of smaller scale risks. Now, this creates idiosyncratic problems for the global economy as well as individual economies. These, for example, could include the greater presence of smaller scale domestic and geopolitical security risks, as well as hidden pockets of leverage within the financial sector, which could become exposed by elevated interest rates and weakening economic fundamentals. So a number of challenges there um, in terms of what they're talking about, but they also point to the fact that fragmented parliaments are currently um, uh, have, uh, have, uh, 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 constraining policy making. And this certainly was one of the things that was, you could hear both in the podium, but also on the corridors at the Commonwealth Parliamentary Conference um, in Canada last year, clearly a concern amongst Commonwealth parliamentarians. So is, our, is there good news? Uh, well, the World Bank point to the fact is, yes, there is greater recognition of the inflation problem. There's also good news on the financial stability front, they felt, that despite in, in repeated interest rate increases, the financial sector has been resilient. And of course, we've seen a greater recognition about large resources to address climate change, and um, uh, Cobb was just mentioned. But let's, let's go below the, the envelope a bit and let's look at some of the regional dynamics and what's going on. Now, South Asia, we know, of course, there are five countries 
from the Commonwealth in South Asia, continues to be adversely affected by spillovers from the invasion of Ukraine, rising global interest rates, and weakening growth in key trading partners. Regional growth there estimated to have slowed to 6.1% last year and projected to slow further um, this year to 5.5%. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa <coughs> slowed to an estimated 3.4% last year as weakening external demand, high inflation, and tightening global financial conditions, dampen regional activity, and again, very modest pickup expected there this year, although the African Development Bank is pointing to East Africa, of course, where there are a number of Commonwealth countries driving that recovery. What was very interesting in this World Bank Commonwealth meeting is they had an extended discussion, which it might not surprise you to hear, on small states. Um, and that was a fascinating um, uh, 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 opportunity. And they talked about um, small states having overlapping crises, multiple challenges, um, in the words of the World Bank, they refer to the, um, small states as being like canaries in the proverbial coal mine. Uh, sorry, in the proverbial coal mine, in the, in the sense that they tell us the magnitude of these shocks that we're experiencing, consequences of these shocks, and what might happen next. So, what happened during the last three years has created in small states, you know, some 33 or so in the Commonwealth, this or 32, 33 in the Commonwealth, this perfect storm for these economies. In the sense that during the pandemic, tourism collapsed. Primarily because of that, these economies contracted by about 11% in 2020, and that's seven times more than what happened in a typical emerging market developing economy. And one of the points that roused a lot of discussion in Marlborough House just last week was the finding that, that from the World Bank that small states often experience disaster-related losses that average roughly 5% of GDP per year, which creates obviously severe obstacles to economic Development. Now, of course, they have a number of risks, small states, from external financing shocks, inflation, global downturn, a global downturn, and climate change and natural disasters. But we've also seen improving growth and resilience in small states. And even if you look at some of the work being done, for example, by Antigua, Barbados, and, and others, very and Dominica, indeed, and very interesting um, uh, work being done there. But the work in terms of how to address this, I think, comes down to areas like enabling diversification through digitization, reducing trade costs, and fostering new industries like ecotourism. I was in Antigua um, just a few weeks ago in St. Lucia a year before and with my 11-year-old daughter. Um, and um, I was very struck by the, the, the tilt and the move towards areas like ecotourism that are now clearly opening up. Investing in climate ad adaptation and domestic renewable energy sources um, as well as also important. But diversification in facilitating that um, the development of blue economy activities and island economies such as aquaculture, carbon sequestration, renewable energy generation, or commercially orientated research is clearly an opportunity um, to harness. Um, I've just got a few minutes to go, so I'm not going to go over time too much, but I'm going to say something about um, briefly risks the Commonwealth and, and what next. So, I mean, the, you, the World Economic Forum produces this global report on global risks, um, which came out again just a few days ago. And in this year's Global Risk Perception Survey, more than four in five respondents anticipated consistent volatility over the next two years. In fact, what we've seen is a return of older risks, inflation, etc., with some of the newer risks, um, um, such as um, you know, cyber security and elsewhere um, coming together, all of that making it more uncertain. So volatility in multiple domains is growing in parallel. And as that happens, the risk of poly crises is referred to accelerates. And that's clearly what's now happening. So, I mean, yes, what to do about it, rebuilding and strengthening global risk preparedness um, comes, into, um, comes into mind, um, but also reinvigorating multilateral processes and organizations becomes critical as well. Areas like robust data exchange and collaborative monitoring processes have already been established for some global risks, natural disasters, extreme weather events, um, and terrorist attacks, amongst others, but greater collaboration across industries and between countries where the Commonwealth could play a role in terms of coordinated funding research and data sharing is critical to help identify weak signals of emerging threats at both a national and global level. So other reports talk about cyber risk and inflation, of course, at levels not seen in a generation, um, and arrested global development. The UN, in fact, we were just speaking over lunch, estimating that after five years of human development progress, we've lost since COVID-19 and the impact has been global. More than 90% of countries have experienced a decline in human development in 2020 or 2021. So particularly serious for um, educational attainment, um, um, and inequality is more children, especially girls, are forced out of school to work. In fact, the pandemic alone 
is projected to force an additional 10 million girls into early marriage by 2030 and lead to the first increase in the practice after more than 20 years of declining rates. Climate change is clearly going to make that worse. And one of the, one of the discussion items in Marlborough House last week was the impact of climate migration as a consequence of some of these issues. Um, at the same time, it's worth bearing in mind, um, Eurasia talked about, um, they, they refer to this as the TikTok boom, but the fact that this Generation Z, you know, the fact that people born from the mid-90s to the early 2000s, um, they're now coming into the job market. I mean, they're now coming into um, areas of, of influence, perhaps more. Um, in fact, Generation Z, um, currently making up 30% of the world's population and expected to comprise 27% of the global workforce in the next 24 months. Um, so, you know, a lot to think about there. So the Commonwealth response really came down to talking about, yes, the severity of the economic... Oops, that's my, that's my um, a time's up um, reminder. But I'll, I'll finish in a couple of minutes, I'm a tough, if that's okay. Um, the Russia-Ukraine conflict is clearly an issue. And, I mean, that's something for the Commonwealth that's had big issues in terms of food security. Two Commonwealth countries, Nigeria and Pakistan, both with elections this year, interestingly, rank amongst the top ten with the largest food insecure populations. Kenya is forecast to be in a food crisis and facing critical levels of malnutrition this year. Um, and I think clearly Commonwealth countries' reliance on food imports is a clear uh, issue and challenge there. Um, there are also, I mean, I won't elaborate too much in the interest of time about points around Commonwealth trade, but I think there, are, there is something there um, to look at, the fact that there's both an evolving dynamics of intra-Commonwealth trade um, in terms of areas like 80% of countries' global trade um, uh, that it consists of that, but also some countries increasing. In fact, we've seen some recovery in intra-commonwealth greenfield investments in 2021. Um, but in terms of some of the um, areas to boost intra-commonwealth trade that have been identified by the Secretariat and, and others, I'll just pick up on three, boosting bilateral and regional trade. Obviously, there are trade agreements coming in. There's also harnessing digital um, technologies for trade and development, as well as um, trade-inclusive um, growth in areas like um, women. Um, and, um, and youth. So what are the entry points for multilateralism? I think one of them is actually around disaster risk reduction. There was a major conference that took place last May in uh, Bali, the UN Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction. I think to the earlier observations, the Commonwealth was MIA in that, in missing an action as an institution. I don't think there was anybody there represented. I may be mistaken, but there certainly did, you didn't see a link between outcomes from that into Commonwealth work unless I've missed it. But there were some important points to take out of that. And in the interest of time, I won't go through it, but the Bali Agenda for Resilience provides a number of very practical things that countries can do to um, sharpen and increase their risk um, in that environment. Um, I think in relation to um, the next few months, I think there are three things that the Commonwealth um, can do around multilateralism, which link to specific meetings. I have mentioned earlier um, the Commonwealth Trade Minister's meeting that's happening. We don't know for sure, but I, th I think it's around June this year is what's been slated in London. Um, that will be a very interesting time in terms of the global cycle to see what's happening there. Um, and certainly there has been some push, I know, to get women in trade on that agenda, given the impact that um, tr um, they've, uh, women are having from the current economic environment. The other area um, is, I mean, youth and gender are often talked about as key areas of the Commonwealth. They are now, um, there's a whole focus on gender and youth mainstreaming. I believe that just before Christmas, responsibility for both those areas have now been pushed back into the Secretary General's office, um, or the Deputy Secretary General's office, but certainly a higher focus there. Um, and that's, I think there's obviously work around that. Um, Pakistan due to host the youth minister's meeting later this year and, um, and Bahamas due to host the women's affairs meeting um, in August, of which there'll be a precursor to that of the UN in, in March. And then finally, on um, the World Telecommunications Development Conference, which is the ITU big meeting that, that um, they mobilized to generate support for the um, SDGs around technology. That was actually held just a few days before Chogum in Kigali. Um, the person who chaired that meeting, the president of that meeting, for me, she's a rock star, really, in this multilateral arena, Paula Ingebera. Paula Ingebera is Rwanda's Minister for ICT and Innovation, 39 years of age. Um, at this very minute, at this very minute, she's on the um, stage at Davos at the World Economic Forum talking about how we can turn technologies into the markets of tomorrow 
drawing upon not just new but old technologies as well. So I think there is, and she outlined, and I wouldn't in the interest of time spell it out, but she outlined three areas in which the Commonwealth innovation ecosystem could be better enabled um, through picking up some of those outcomes from the World Telecommunications Development Conference. So my message in a nutshell is, if people remember Ian Dury, reasons to be cheerful. There are one, two, and three reasons at least to be cheerful. But I think the, 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 the more important point is um, cheerfulness matters for naught if we don't have a room of people willing to drive that conversation forward. Thank you. We've had three very different and three very interesting and three very substantive statements. Um, I'm sorry if there has been a lot of doom and gloom that um, is perceived through it all. But um, as Arif said at the end, there are also reasons to be cheerful and ways to perhaps create cheer. Uh, in dealing with the many issues that have been already raised, I think you all need to be conscious that this is only session one, that we have a session after this on climate change, inequality, development, small states. Tomorrow morning we have a session on human rights, on democracy, on uh, media freedom. We have a final session looking ahead for the Commonwealth, and we have two keynote speeches. So there is a lot to go yet. But I will now open the floor for questions and comments. There are two roving microphones around, and what I would request you to do is to very briefly say who you are so that uh, everybody knows who you are, and uh, be very brief, as brief as you possibly can. Thank you. Um, let me give the floor to Sue Onslow first. Thank you, Stuart, very much. Uh, thank you, speakers. My question is to all of the speakers. Given that the poly crises that uh, the world is facing today, and of course the Commonwealth as a global subsystem um, is both reflective and participating in these multiple shocks and the multiple risks. To my mind as a historian, I'm also thinking of the earlier era of the 1970s, when there was an energy shock, when there was a debt crisis, when states found that they were under pressure from the IFIs, when there was food insecurity, when debt was faltering, and when autocracy was on the rise across Commonwealth states. To what extent do you think that the Commonwealth could uh, look back and see whether it could draw lessons um, from that earlier era? In no way do I want to say, okay, here's a lesson, because everything, of course, is historically contingent. But is there a role for smart politics in looking back? What can be drawn from that era? Um, is there a place for the Commonwealth to focus on those major commissions, um, the participation of Sonny Ramphal in the major expert working groups, the way that he promoted them, he took part in the Brundtland Commission, he took part in the Brandt Commission, to really craft what would be developmental answers for the crises shaping, shaping and facing the world. And also a question for the panelists, what about regionalism? You didn't touch on that. You seem to stay at the macro level or the micro level of states. What of regionalism? Um, the way, has it, is it eroding the efficacy in the Commonwealth, or is it part of a Commonwealth secret weapon um, arsenal? Thank you very much. If I may, I may take uh, a bunch of two or three questions together so we can uh, make better use of time and allow more people to ask. The lady in the back there. Thank you. I'm Darini, MBA graduate from the University of Oxford. My question is for Paul. Um, as a solution to democracy backsliding, you mentioned scholarships for young activists for democracy. How would you ensure that without making those scholars a target uh, of their regime, especially if they're authoritarian? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one more question, if there is one. Mark here, Mark Robinson. Thank you. Thank you very Wait much. for the microphone. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, speakers. Um, Soft power, yes, I sort of think about behind the curtains. And what you've all told us is that Commonwealth does some very interesting work behind the curtains. But we don't always hear what the follow-up is. Um, we come away thinking, well, this has been a wonderful meeting, but then um, silence. And is it because we're unable to project ourselves on these issues, or is it just the harsh nature of 24-hour news that unless it's real news, it doesn't get covered? Thanks very much. So we've had, we've had three questions about lessons that can be drawn from the earlier experience of the 1970s. Uh, what about regionalism? 
a specific question to Paul about democratic backsliding, possibly putting in peril people who agitate uh, for greater democracy. And uh, we don't always hear about the work that is being done by the Commonwealth behind the, the scenes. Why should it remain so under wraps? Um, Paul, would you like to take the direct question first? Uh, well, okay. Um, I maybe um, give a comment on, I'll just take them in order. I mean, I, the, the question about um, the 1970s is a good one. I mean, uh, you know, Margaret Macmillan says, you know, be careful uh, to learn from history, um, not just contingency, but, you know, other factors. But, I mean, you gave the answer. I was writing down, what is my answer? My answer was leadership. We had leadership in the 1970s, not just from Sunny Ramphal, but in a number of Commonwealth countries. So there was a, a, a kind of core group which allowed things to happen. I mean, leadership is a very funny thing. Um, uh, you know, I'm not claiming to be an expert on it, but you, know, you can be a leader of, of, of absolutely nothing, but if you have good ideas, charisma, a willingness to put, for, put them forward, take risks, then you can have power and influence. And um, I just don't see that at the moment. I mean, you know, it's, it's a complicated question to go into. So I, I do think <clears> that, and I mean, uh, and, and experts, I mean, expertise has been ridiculed in, 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 in the current age. And perhaps the internet actually devalues expertise because there's just so much information around. When I was quoting this article from The Economist, you know, if I'd quoted that in the 70s, every one of you would have read it. You know, you would have, we would have all been talking on the same page. But probably now, I mean, can I, 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 no, I won't ask how many people have read it, but you know, it's the front cover, it's a three page article, it's very, very interesting. It happened to feed into what I've been thinking about. Um, so, so that's interesting. Uh, look, the scholarships idea is not, it, it, you know, it, it may involve risk, I agree, but it's not totally novel. I mean, Ameri the American, uh, there are American agencies, that, you know, which, which do give these scholarships. And I'm thinking about pre-activism. Pre I'm, think I'm thinking about younger people who may become influential and hopefully they may become, become leaders. Um, but remember, most countries inside the Commonwealth are not authoritarian, okay? So I agree, we'd have to look at Fiji and Madagascar and, and a few others I showed on the slide. Um, and we'd have to be careful. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a core of, say, 250 people from across the... I mean, this is, we're talking about youth, and I don't know how effective these youth congresses are and so on and so forth. I've been to lots of events, and they do fizzle out. But if we had 250 people who we worked with over three years, who met each other, formed networks, learned from each other, some were lawyers, some were, um, you know, uh, I don't know, in different, from different fields, you know, development economists and so on, and they could actually act as gadflies within their country. I just think it would be terrific. Um, I, I, I won't say anything about the news, but I, d I do, I think I agree with Mark. I mean, I think probably, but he's the one to tell us, he and Stuart and Richard and others, you know what goes on behind the scenes. And, uh, and that's why I call myself an outsider. I don't necessarily know all the good work that's done. The question is, should we raise the flag so that more people know more about the Commonwealth and its reputational decline is changed? Thanks, Paul. Um, David, can I give you the floor and can I just perhaps remind that in your own remarks earlier, you mentioned a few organizations that have a constant interaction with the United Nations, a, a dialogue. You mentioned the Francophonie and the community of Portuguese-speaking countries and that the Commonwealth was missing. Incidentally, all those, including the CPLP and the Francophonie, are referred to as regional organizations. Um, regionalism was an issue that yes, Sue did, raised. Yeah. Would you like to respond? <clears throat> well, coming back to Sue's questions first, um, <clears throat> I'm just struck by the article which has been in the New York Times this last couple of days about what's going to happen when the United States runs out of money, um, and which is quite soon. Um, and I can't say we've been here before, but there are precedents which have been put forward. No, I don't see the Commonwealth <clears throat> actually coming up with a, <clears throat> a 
believable solution? What should it stick to instead? Um, I think its greatest strengths are in matching social justice and climate justice. It has particular strengths because of small islands, because it's, it's stretched across different nations and with different challenges. So that's where I think rather than finance, I would, I would say its strengths are. As far as that, I would say, is the secret weapon. Um, but it, like, sin, like the Sleeping Beauty, it's been sleeping for quite a long time. But that's, it's easy for me to say that because you, in working closely with the Commonwealth, know that much better than I do and must be much, much more frustrated. Um, as far as the extension of, of with, with the United Nations is concerned, I don't think I have much to add to what I said. The United Nations is an open door. Um, and there are 56 members there who have a common link, which haven't, who have not exploited that common link. And it's such a soft organization um, to exploit the United Nations, why not do it? Um, I was scrambling away for examples of soft power examples. The most wonderful soft power example we were dis half discussed a moment ago was the nine countries from the Commonwealth who did not respond to the Russian invasion in Ukraine. As mentioned before in our Zoom meeting, I wrote to all of the High Commissioners and said, um, please can you explain, bearing in mind your country has said X or Y or Z in the past. Um, I'm not going to ask another question around, because I know you all know the answer. How many of them responded? Not at all. And this is disappointing. But the, but the example of soft power being used was that in the 1960s and the 1970s, the Soviet Union made sure that lots of young, talented Africans had a, uh, an education in, in Moscow. And uh, 9,000, I believe, are the figures altogether. And a lot of them are in senior positions and feel they owe a lot to a distant power, which doesn't exist anymore, but nevertheless, those, those emotional links are there. You can understand what, young, how, what impact that must have had on the young men. And now um, that soft power is being repaid 50 years later. Um, let's not be too surprised about that. But it is annoying that I, I would, would have thought that there must be some forum, maybe it's the High Commissioners in London, to, and who would, who would convene them? You know, sometimes they say, well, it should be us and the United Nations Association, who don't have any, uh, any sort of baggage with us in saying to them, um, why not um, come along and dis discuss it? How, how authoritative do they think they could be? But then I tried that when it came to, as we mentioned, my work with the um, continuing embarrassment of the, the US, UK and other governments not talking about what they know about the death of Dag Hammarskjöld. When we tried to pull together um, African country, post, post Hammarskjöld's death, African countries to come and hear about it, very few of them were an age where perhaps it was very important to them. And yet, what happened at that time, the involvement of Western powers and the Soviet Union for that matter, in Africa's messed up 30 years or so, um, should, have in, should interest them. There's a sort of a blankness there. So when it comes to soft power, um, I laugh at all the efforts we do because as, as Arifa said, um, no, it was Paul, the soft power index shows how fickle it is. I spoke earlier about countries can put on another cloak to suit them. They can um, be, they go up and down the soft power index to make you think that the British Council's dancers from Aberdeen performing in the Sudan might not really be very effective in the end. But what is effective, who knows? But those nine countries did stop voting against Russia. And there's something happened there. And that's an example of soft power at work. So that's my last comment. Thanks very much, David. Uh, Arif, can I hmm? pass you the floor? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting just on, on you know, using assets and soft power. As Helen will probably remember, the Commonwealth Businesswomen's Network is currently developing a, an accelerator for women entrepreneurs. And one of the components of that is actually to tap into the Chevening alumni as mentors, which, if you think about it, is a very obvious asset and opportunity. The Chevening alumni are probably one of the most underutilized power networks out there. Um, but I think on regionalism, I think your points are, are well taken, um, Sue. And I think, at the, but at the same time, think about regionalism. I mean, I think, and, I, and I've just come back from 
um, from Pakistan, where I had the opportunity of meeting this, now, people think Sark is a dodo and it doesn't do anything. But actually, what's interesting about Sark, the South Asia grouping, is not the, so much the government side, it's the civil society side. And I had a very interesting meeting with the um, Sark chamber, who is actually headquartered in Islamabad, about some of the things that they have been doing despite all of the challenges, which you really wouldn't believe. So there are pockets there to look at. I think on, on Africa, on regionalism, I think clearly the momentum on the African continental free trade area, where it's significant that Commonwealth countries have been at the forefront in driving that momentum and benefit for, um, for trade connectivity is important. And let's not forget, I mean, when Dr. Ngozi, again, you know, um, obviously from Nigeria, a great Commonwealth friend, Director General of the World Trade Organization, when she came to, um, and Brian, you remember, she, she met us there in the, um, when the um, heads of government overran heavily on their intensive internal discussions. Um, and um, they, they came out over lunch and she made a point of saying, I remember speaking to her then, she said, look, you've been able to do more at this Chogha meeting um, that I was able to do just last week in Geneva at the World Trade Organization. And particularly some of the stuff you've done around getting countries to come to a consensus about women in trade. I, w I just wasn't able to get through even in Geneva. So let's not forget that we do have these areas where we are able to actually drive this momentum, but we also need strong Commonwealth advocates. And that's why I gave just one example of Paula Ingebera. She's one person, okay, she's in Rwanda, but she's in a global role in terms of some of the global shifts that are going on. And with the other examples one can think about. And finally, I'll just close in terms of soft power. What's not been mentioned, and actually I thought it was, it was quite incredible to be part of that. Brian, I remember seeing you there with some of those. The Commonwealth Games, um, not the Games itself, although well, let's not forget the sports ministers meeting that took place at the Games. Commonwealth countries were saying, we've been able to broker agreements here, particularly about protection of athletes, that the UN would never, or the, or the Olympic movement would never agree to. And that happened at a Commonwealth meeting in Birmingham last July. But what was really interesting about Birmingham, I felt, and the Commonwealth Lawyers Association and others were certainly part of that, some of those side events that were organized, um, Joe Lomas from the UK government, I don't think is in the room yet, but you know, the UK government did a huge program on basically parallel activities, which was phenomenal in bringing together this meaning and value of the wider Commonwealth, including and working with, if I may say, accredited organizations that are very important in this this mix as well. So let's not forget about the power of these broader initiatives. Um, and Brian, I mean, you may want to pick up on that, you know, later, but I thought it was very useful when you and I were there with some of the other organizations, the sports ministers meeting. I was taken aback by some of the um, consensus that was there on sports and, um, and youth to an extent as well that Commonwealth countries were able to, to talk about, that they were citing specifically they would never be able to do in a UN context for obvious reasons. Thank you. Can I just um, add a footnote to Arif? I mean, you've just illustrated the power of Mark's point. I read the news. I'm a sports fiend. I read everything I can about sports. It's a childhood thing. Um, and I looked very, very hard for comments or reports that went beyond the immediate sporting activity. I found none. I mean, I read four newspapers a day. Um, I get hard copies, so my wife is very upset because we have garages full of papers. But I couldn't find any comments. So maybe, you know, it's, 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 and yet you're saying all these good things were done. Mm -hmm. there, wasn't, there wasn't even, you know, some, some of the sports commentators who write their weekly yeah, yeah. things on the Sunday Times, the back of the Sunday Times, very good article usually, nothing picked up. Yeah, thank you for that observation. Uh, before I open the floor for further questions and comments, I just wanted to make one comment myself and this was in the context of Sue's question on regionalism. Um, Paul referred to this almost in passing, but it, I think it's a very important development. We are talking about multilateralism here. The, the United Kingdom decided to turn its back on one of the most important multilateral bodies on Earth, a regional body, but with global impact. It's called the European Union. I might feel very strongly about it. Others. I know it's polarized this country as well. But as Paul mentioned, a number of countries in Africa, in uh, the Caribbean, in the Pacific, felt very upset that the, Europe, that the UK had left the European Union because it was a vehicle for their interests also being pursued in the European Union. And as far as I'm concerned, the UK cut itself adrift. 
and shot itself in the foot. Uh, may I open the floor for further questions? Sandy Jones here. Thanks. Um, a couple of quick points. I'll try, I'll, we'll try and be brief. Um, I was struck by the matrix uh, that you offered us, um, Paul, and um, it, it, it looked to me conceptually very much like a corporate risk register. You, you've got um, countries in <coughs> red, amber, and green categories, and you've also got a little arrow as to whether they're getting worse or getting better, the direction of That's travel. Me. Sorry? Okay, yeah, yeah. And, and I just thought that you know, if, it, if, it, if it were a corporate risk register, then the most important bit would be the columns to the right that say, and what are we going to do about it? So what's the action plan to address the things that are red or amber and, and or getting worse? So um, I just wonder whether you think that framework can be used prescriptively as well as descriptively. And the other quick point was um, your point, David, about um, the UN at its best, working in quite a coordinated way. Um, I had the privilege of working in Indonesia just after the um, multi-party elections in 2000, which were closely timed with the similar event in Nigeria. And that was a time when in both those countries, the entire international community development assistance agencies pulled very closely together. And in, in Indonesia, it wasn't just that the UNDP, ResRep, was coordinating all the, all the UN agencies, but actually coordinating bigger efforts, including the World Bank and the Asia Development Bank and other entities. And that looked to me like uh, international assistance at its very best and at its highly coordinated. But it seems to me that we only get that level of coordination when um, either there's a major risk and crisis or a major opportunity, which I think is what was going on, a, you know, a moment of great opportunity, which was what was going on in Nigeria and in Indonesia at that particular moment in time. So how could we, what we could, could we do to ensure that that optimal level of, of um, coordination and collaboration happens other than purely in times of crisis or, certain, or, or um, unique opportunity? Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, she'll give the floor to the gentleman in the back there. Thank you. Um, Nick Hardman, Mountford, Commonwealth Secretariat. Um, so, um, I, uh, first, uh, so, so just responding really some comments to, to, to what's been raised. Um, um, Paul, I, I, I'm also a big fan of hard copy newspapers, but when it comes to reading about the Commonwealth, I find the digital sources better, and particularly our own website, which actually talks a lot about what we do, and we've got huge amounts of information on there of pretty much everything we do. And so. Um, I'm not sure how, how familiar you are with it, but I would encourage you to use that as one of your sources um, in, in looking at what we do. Um, one of the things we've done is sign an overarching MOU with the UN Secretary General um, back in, I think it was 2020, um, and uh, we've been starting to implement that. Um, there's a number of initiatives. Um, women uh, sort of and, and gender was raised we um, ha already contribute strongly to uh, UN women's machineries uh, through through the work of the Commonwealth um, and so, so, so that's one example um, we um, also um, our universal vulnerability index has been a strong um, influence on the multilateral vulnerability index being developed by the UN um, and um, the um, I, I'm going to talk later about um, sustainable energy transition and w we have a strong partnership with the UN's Sustainable Energy for All. Um, these are just a, a few examples. Um, I, India, at its UN India Fund, has a Commonwealth window um, and um, that, it, that is for funding Commonwealth states and where we um, can bid for funds to partner with UN agencies and, we, and we've started doing that. We've, we've got projects um, in Barbados and Bahamas at the moment and more in the pipeline. So, so, so just a few examples of some of the things we are doing. Um, and um, so, so, so within that sort of context, uh, what I heard a lot of was um, what the Commonwealth is not doing and what its role is not. So, so I, I guess if I was going to put one question to the panel, it would be within one sentence, can you now answer the question, what is the role for the Commonwealth? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. Uh, I have Bala Chandramohan <coughs> here, and I'll come back to the young man in the back. Um, I was thinking, you know, um, I attended the uh, COP27 conference with Shamal Sheikh uh, as a delegate of uh, Canterbury 
Climate Action Partnership. And during the um, event, and reflecting on the title that we have, uh, I was thinking whether we should think about global solutions rather than global challenges. What I noticed is that there was a multiplicity of solutions that have come up, and even Commonwealth countries are looking for uh, something where they had individual strengths. For example, I visited three pavilions, UK, Namibia, and India. And for example, India was focusing on ISO, or International Solar Alliance, ISA. So they were trying to project how uh, the Solar Alliance was helping um, climate change uh, adaptation in, in Mauritius, and so on. And at the same time, local government organizations, cities, for example, the mayors formed a group which again tried to find solutions at sub-national levels. So I have a feeling that the, what we may want to see is the way in which <coughs> global organizations uh, are looking for solutions where they have individual strengths or collective strengths. I also visited the office, of, um, the Commonwealth Secretar Secretariat had then, and then Mr. Uni Krishnan, who was coordinating this, gave a uh, big um, an introduction to what, the work, what work is being done. But at the same time, I noticed that you know, Francophonie had uh, a big, um, of big pavilion, and in that sense, you know, if you're really comparing by pavilion to pavilion, uh, which is what the, the visual impact that people have. Uh, it might be that Commonwealth can realize its strengths by making it more visible uh, <coughs> by, actual, uh, by actual presence in terms of projected in terms of actual presence. So my conclusion here is that global challenges are common, but global solutions are different. Uh, solar alliance, nuclear uh, lobbies, and then you have uh, oil lobbies. So you, they were all trying to project which was more effective as in to, to address climate change. So maybe we should think about solutions and how the solutions, the diversity of solutions, can provide us with something to be more positive. Thank you. Thanks very much. We've really um, come to the almost the end of our session, but I had promised the young gentleman there, if you can be very quick, and then I will ask my panelists to respond and make final comments. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, my name's Abhir. I'm the Youth Advisor to the Governing Board at CHEC. Uh, my question is very short. Um, it's, it's for Dr. Paul. Um, you spoke about the rise of China and, you know, of course, coming from India, that's something even I find very concerning. Um, but what do you think is the role for the Commonwealth to counteract that? You spoke about trade, uh, but drawing your attention to what's being called debt trap diplomacy uh, that China is employing with Sri Lanka, with Pakistan. Um, how do you think the Commonwealth can <coughs> counteract uh, that and also the rise of China at large. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, I will request uh, my panelists to <coughs> speak in the order in which they started, uh, David, Paul, and Arif, to make their final comments and respond to some of the questions that have been asked. Firstly, congratulations. This is, this is a point that Arif made in this last, the last round. Uh, congratulations to those involved in the, with the side, side, sidebar events for the Commonwealth Games. I was involved with the Olympic Games on the Olympic truce and trying to get sense out of the Foreign Office, which had got themselves involved with it, trying to promote to, through the, with the principle of soft power, this, um, the principle of the Olympic truce and at the same time the great program, great this, great that, great that, um, which has been going on pretty well ever since then. And these two programs, which were soft power of the, the British at the time of the Olympics, fought each other so much, it was so disappointing. Um, so I'm good for the, Olympi the, good for the Commonwealth Games. <clears throat> as far as Indonesia is concerned, very welcome story. Thank you very much. Um, it, all I'm stressing, I suppose, that one must keep working at that all the time. Some countries have maybe a poorer resident uh, coordinator and it falls apart a bit, but obviously that case, in your case, it was still working well. The single sentence, sir, mine would be an echo of what I was saying before. The Commonwealth should be for climate justice and social justice and show you can, and you will leave no one behind. Um, as far as Bala's concerned, 
interesting what's happening with Francophonie at COP27. My encounter with Ron, Sir Ron Sanders was actually in 2021 when we had a joint meeting with the Institute of, of Commonwealth Studies trying to energise the Commonwealth to have a policy going to Chogham in 21, which would actually get a focused story of the, from the Commonwealth which would go to Glasgow. Well, of course, as we all know, Chogham that year didn't happen, so collapse of our great plan. Um, and the Commonwealth didn't come up, well, certainly loss and damage sh should have come up at Glasgow, didn't have to wait to Sham. So those are my answers. Okay. Yep. Um, very, very briefly. It, it, what I did um, was to, I, I looked at various tables. There's no Commonwealth data. So what I did was extract for two years, compare the data and then put the arrows and so on myself. The coloring is my coding, just to make it simple. Um, I think there are some, there's more background which could be used. The question is, uh, can we, in, in a club with so much variability, are we, are we allowed to? Therefore, my answer in my talk, which probably wasn't very clear, was to do it tangentially by having uh, democracy conferences, democracy scholarships, democracy courses, and collecting data, self-reflective data, specifically. I mean, if someone wants to give me 5,000 pounds, I could collect masses of data from existing sources. We don't have to reinvent it. You don't have to have a kind of huge uh, initiative and do this and do that. Um, look, when, you, when you're speaking like this, you're, you're not, we're not trying to criticize people from within the family. Um, there is a lot going on, which is good stuff. But you made, the, you, you made the point for me by saying, if you go to this website, you will find out what we're doing. That is the point. We, we, I, we've got to tell Guardian readers. We've got to tell Times readers. We've got to tell Telegraph readers. We've got to tell, above all, FT readers, because they are the game changers. They're not going to go to some website and delve down. And by the way, the websites are not that good. You know, our generally, our Commonwealth websites are not, not front rank. The, okay. Um, very good. But, you know, it, it's kind of hard work. At, uh, you know, we're doing our best, but it's hard keeping up because we're not, you know, we're, we're not rich. Um, but, but, you, but that's the point. Um, you know, it's not, to, it's not to throw stones too much, although they're easy targets. Gender equality is an easy issue. You can measure. You know, we're all talking about it. It's the deeper processes that I want to get into. Um, what's my sentence? Well, actually, your sentence was brilliant, David. It's quite similar. Promote democracy, freedom, human rights, justice across the whole family. But you had a very good thing about not, not, not leaving anyone behind. I like, I like that. That was um, uh, Mrs. Reagan who used to talk about that. Um, global solutions, absolutely. Yeah. I think we're, both, we're all trying to do that. I mean, you, you, know, you emphasize the point. Okay, rise of China. Look, China, China exists, so we've got to coexist with it. We've, we've got to understand it. And we had a policy. We said change through trade. That's not going to happen. That's not going to work. Um, so we've got to mitigate its exploitation. That's what I'm saying. And the, you know, the Commonwealth isn't, you know, it's not that powerful, but it could help mitigate damage. If, uh, uh, you know, the, the experience of, of, of Zambia, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, we don't want that to be repeated. You know, we don't, I don't want to be sitting here in 10 years' time at the next conference here and saying, you know, we've now got 12 Commonwealth countries in sovereign debt, all in hock to, to China, you know, and having to give up ports for strategic alliance. You know, surely we can, we can work um, to, um, you know, to, to, to share advice, to share experience, um, but also take the blinkers off your eyes. I mean, coexist, work out strategies. You know, the, I, I can't remember, but the British government report has two things. It says something like uh, improved trade, but systemic threat, okay? So in the same sentence, it's, it's pointing both ways. And I think, I think it's, a, it's a difficult, uh, 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 there's no easy solution. You knew that when you asked the question. We can talk a little bit about over tea. But, um, you know, coexistence, but, you know, without blinkers. Thanks very much.
Sorry. Right, here's a plug for the Institute of Commonwealth Studies website, the YouTube channel, Sue. There was a series of three um, 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 webinars that took place in 2021, which touches on a lot of what we've been talking about in this session. Um, the electorate of interest, I mean, I organised that with Philip, um, but it was on business and the Commonwealth. Now, one of those actually focused on a topic that I think has a lot of traction in potential which is um, risk and resilience. And there's a lot of potential in developing a gr much greater um, learning and um, collaborating space around risk and resilience. And there are conversations going on right now to establish something along those lines at a Commonwealth-wide level. So we could learn from the best and also apply you know, lessons, lessons from the worst, whether it's disaster risk or other forms of, of, um, of risk and resilience. And that's the way that you can begin to move the agenda forward. So check out the YouTube channel on the uh, ICWS website. Right, thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed. And um, I must apologize to uh, Victoria and Alex for having gone about six and a half minutes beyond schedule. Uh, don't gulp your tea and burn yourselves. Uh, I, will not, I will not attempt to summarize, uh, partly because of paucity of time, but largely because of the degree of difficulty. Uh, we've, covered <coughs> we've covered a vast canvas, and no doubt there shall be further discussions. Um, I would simply like you to please join me in a round of applause to our panelists. And, and, and to them I will say our job is done, session one. Uh, now it's a matter of sit back, relax and enjoy the flight.